Hello, happy Thursday. Welcome to Ask Serena Live. Hey, Kimberly. Welcome, welcome. It's mommy night. We're about to get into it tonight. This is a topic I am fired up about. Let me flip you guys around. There you are. Hello. So, there you go. I'm like kind of summery tonight. I'm feeling like if I dress summery, maybe we'll get warmer weather. Today was kind of frigid in New York for my liking, at least for March. I don't know if I should be used to it already, but it was like just kind of freezing. So tonight I figured I'd just like throw something on that makes me feel springy. So welcome, welcome to Ask Serena Live. This is my weekly show that I do every week, every Thursday at 11 p.m. Um, where I talk about pretty much whatever I'd like, but more importantly, it's usually around life, work, and everything in between. So that's a little bit about the show. A little bit about me. I am the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations LLC based in Port Jefferson Station, New York. And my business is a business strategy consulting firm where I focus on HR and talent management practices and strategy. I also focus on digital marketing and I look at the overall strategy for small to mid-sized businesses as well as startups. So that is a little bit about me. And of course, if you want to find out more about what I do and what I have done, you can find more information at talentthinkinnovations.com. So enough about me and more about moms. So tonight's topic is about moms returning to work. And I kind of coined it unwelcomed moms returning to work. Um, and I did that a bit on purpose, probably a little biased only because I have personally birthed three children. So I have a seven year old, an almost four year old and an almost two year old. So this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And I am also a former HR practitioner, um, so double whammy, right? And so I kind of know how this goes um, when you've decided that, you know, you and your significant other have decided to start a family and you decide as a woman that you're gonna go and, you know, have children and you have to be then faced with, you know, I'm having these kids, but then there's like, what happens to my career? You know, how is this gonna hinder me? So I don't think that I'm ever alone in that whole, how that kind of internal conversation happens. It's kind of like, um, you know, it's time to have kids. I feel like it's time. Like every woman I think knows when it's their time. And then, you know, you get excited about that. You get excited about the possibility of starting this family. And it's a beautiful thing. Obviously, it's a fact of life. That's how, you know, we have X amount of humans inhabiting the planet Earth. Um, but then you also start to think about, well, who, you know, I had these certain aspirations that I wanted to obtain. Um, while in the workforce and what is this decision of me wanting to become a mom going to do to those opportunities? Um, and so, you know, you never quite know. And obviously it also depends on the company that you work for, whether or not um, it will hinder you or if it will just not do anything at all and you'll just bounce back and everything will be everything. Um, I do think there's some great companies out there that, you know, are very cognizant of um, championing people's personal lives 
and allowing them to stretch and grow personally without it hindering them climbing the ladder. I think more often than not, it's the opposite, which is that we still aren't in a collective place where women um, can make a decision about having children and still have it all on the other end. So obviously there's been tons and tons of books on this. It's the topic of articles every year. It's the topic of, you know, books and, and theories about, you know, whether a woman can have it all. And I think it's very subjective. I think you'll find people, professional women that will say, yes, you can have it all. It's all a matter of prioritizing and going for it and leaning in. I wasn't a fan of that, by the way. So let me put that out there. Um, and then you'll have the women that say, no, I really had to choose. I had to choose. I wanted to be more of a mother or I wanted to be more with my kids and I was made to choose or I could not re-enter the workforce after having children for whatever reason. And then when I wanted to, there were no jobs. So this is kind of where I'm driving the conversation. So you know me, I'm a data gal. I wanted to share some stats. So this stat was as of 2013, 40% um, of households with children under 18 years of age um, have women in those households who are either the primary or, or sole sources of income for the family. So that's important. Now, granted, it's in 2013, but that's important to know, um, largely because that's a tremendous amount of households that are supported by women. And so I'll get into the nooks and crannies of what happens in the workforce, but if women can't decide to have families and then have a seamless way of re-entering the workforce, that's a problem. We're creating economic issues now for families. So I thought that was compelling to share. Um, the other statistic that I have is 31% of women voluntarily left the workforce between 2004 and 2009, primarily for childcare reasons. Another instance in which, and I'll share, I feel employers can do more if they can. They can certainly do more that's fairly high as well. Since we're on the topic of childcare, let's keep going. Childcare has risen 168% in over 25 years. The average amount of childcare that's paid per household right now is $18,000 a year. $18,000. And, um, they say that your childcare should not exceed 10% of your take home pay. And what this article said, and um, it's by, I'll tell you right now who it's by. It was, the actual statistics came from, it was a HuffPost business article and it's called one quarter of mothers return to work less than two weeks after giving birth. Um, it was the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but in any event, 30% of take home is spent on childcare. Another economic issue, problem. Um, so it's a double whammy, double, double whammy. So here, here's the thing, um, you have FMLA which, you know, if you happen to be a full-time employee and you happen to work these, this magical number of hours in a year, they will safeguard your job for 12 weeks, a whopping 12 weeks. Fantastic. Most mothers, and I mean even up the ranks, highest of high, who have had children will tell you 12 weeks is nearly not even enough time to spend with your kids, to bond with your child after childbirth. It just isn't. 
Now, many people aren't fortunate enough to just kind of leave the workforce and sustain themselves and be at home with their kids and just say whatever. Many people just have to return to work. I know as an HR practitioner, many, many days, I had you know entry-level staff that I would hire for, and I've had so many people, so many women, who were in entry level positions that you know they weren't really high enough on the food chain so to speak to have a lot of time but they needed a job who literally had to give birth to their children and be back after like a c-section in four weeks ridiculous um but it is what it is and that's that but let's get back to the ones that have a choice um, of whether they want to return to work or not. So you decide as a mom, you know what, that 12 weeks, that sucks. And, you know, by the by, in the U.S., we still haven't caught up with the times in terms of having mandated maternity leave. So your maternity leave, in a lot of regards, is based upon how much vacation you accrue, how much sick time you accrue, um, and or if your employer is nice enough to grant you some sort of maternity leave. So there's that. Um, but beyond that, you're stuck with a short amount of time, um, 12 weeks at best, at a minimum, if you're a full-time employee, and you have a decision to make. Do I go back to work? And maybe you just sit down with your significant other and decide, you know what, I am going to just ride this out. I want to be with my child. I'm going to stay home. We'll figure it out financially. Fine. So you do that and you spend maybe, you know, the first four or five years, some women stay out 11 years. What happens when the child has now grown up or the child is more self-sufficient than they had been as a baby and the woman says to herself, you know what, there's nothing much here for me to do. Things are running its course. I'm ready to return to work. Can she return to work and pick up from where she left off? Not at all. Not at all. So, so many times I've had jobs open when I sat in a recruiting position. And, you know, there were jobs that could be done by a great many people as long as they were qualified. And I'd get stay-at-home moms who were professionals in a previous life, who took hiatuses from their you know, professions and who applied to these jobs. And hand over fist, they would not be the ones that got picked for any sort of professional job. And the reason why, they've been out of the workforce too long. Too many things have changed and so we can't afford to spend time training them up or waiting for them to get back up to speed. So let's go back to the statistics for a second. 40% of households with children under the age of 18 are supported by a woman, either as a primary breadwinner or the sole person working, right? And so skills are too old, they don't have time to train, they really, let's just keep it real, they can't be bothered, right? They can't be bothered. So therefore, now what do you do? Kids are in schools, kids are more self-sufficient, you've gone to school, you're really a professional, but you took time to take care of your family, and here it is, the workforce at large is not prepared for you. They're not prepared or they don't want to lift a finger to ensure that you are doing exactly, that you're able to kind of seamlessly work your way back into the workforce. So here's the thing, let me, let me just be fair. There's something called returnships. Um, and as far as my research can tell me, these returnships, this is something that was coined, I think, by Goldman Sachs. Um, it kind of hit the scene in 2008, and Goldman Sachs, as far as I can tell, is one of the first, if not the first company to create a returnship. What is a returnship? You gotta love the buzzwords. 
So, a returnship basically is an internship of sorts um, for people who were professionals who had worked before but have taken long hiatuses from the workforce. Um, and basically these programs allow these people to re-enter the workforce through some sort of training program or apprenticeship, if that makes sense. So, excuse me, 2008 is as far as I can go back in finding a returnship and Goldman Sachs kind of set the tone for this. Um, basically, Goldman Sachs' uh, program is for people that have been out of the workforce for two or more years. Um, it's like a 10 to 14 week program. It's seen as an internship on their end. So they do try to hire from this pool and they have hired from the pool. Um, but by and large, it's an internship, not a full-time position. And so they leave it very open where it's like, you can be employed, you may not be employed. We'll see what happens. Um, I found it interesting that in 2013, out of a thousand applicants, only 19 people were chosen. So, you know, I don't really have the number of how many women in general are out there you know, with a particular background that may put work for like a Goldman Sachs, but 19 people out of a thousand, that's hella competitive. Like that's a lot competitive. Um, I mean, you're not even saying like a quarter or more or 30%, not even 30, not 50 people, 19. So, you know, I don't really necessarily know how successful this program is. Um, the numbers scare me a bit. They just do. Um, but they are the early pioneers of this returnship thing. The only, the one, here's the two things I have to say about them. So I think for all of the companies that I'm going to share a little bit about what they're doing, um, I think you have to add a bare minimum just kind of fist bump them for trying just for trying i sat i did the research and obviously i'm going through the numbers and i'm looking at who's doing what and part of me became a little judgmental in my head about how much are they doing like you know are they doing enough um you know how successful is this really and I'll get to some of that, but I think I had to I had to stop myself and say for a second that the fact that they're even trying to create a pathway for women to re-enter the workforce, I think requires some kudos. I think requires some claps and and you know some praising because they don't have to do it, but they're doing it. So We'll, we'll talk about that, but I will say that for Goldman Sachs, the numbers scare me a bit. I think it's highly competitive. It's probably out of the grasp of a lot of women's um, hands in terms of re-entering. It just seems very lofty, but they're trying. So then I found Goldman Sachs, and here we find another one. So we have J.P. Morgan Chase, who has a re-entry program as well. That launched in 2013, so it's a newer program. Um, they have been working with people who are in the financial services field, but have since also expanded to uh, people who have a background in law. 26 women have been accepted to date. That's as of 2015. 10 to 14 weeks. VP level pay. That's the key, VP level pay. And they offer a full-time position as well as mentorship. It is, however, only limited to New York. I found a lot of these programs are limited to New York for the time being, um, but they are looking to expand. So JP Morgan Chase, to me, went a step further. And I wanna piece apart the differences. This is not me being critical of Goldman Sachs just to be critical, but if you think about the statistics that I shared before, which is the fact that many women are the breadwinners, excuse me, the breadwinners in their homes. 
this is an economic factor. Women who have stopped working for their children and now want to re-enter need jobs, not internships, they need jobs. So while I agree 100% that there has to be some level of training, there has to be some level of mentorship um, in order to get them up to speed on all the things that they might have missed while they were out of the workforce, I can't see how any returnship or there's another t um, buzzword that's being used now, on-ramping and off-ramping. I can't even, but in any event, if you're going to have any kind of program like this, it can't be about just an internship because realistically at this point in their lives, they're not, they are not college students. They're not. These are not people we're talking about that have no experience. They have experience. In many cases, they've got years, 25 plus years, some of these people of experience and even if it's 10 years of experience that all has to be taken into consideration and so you can't start throwing them in programs like they're college students like they're at the bottom all over again it's almost like typecasting moms as you know never having had a professional experience or career because they chose to have kids it's almost like oh you chose to have kids well um you know, hey, that kind of sucks. Come over here and get this training because we're sure that nothing you knew prior to you going on maternity leave is still in your brain. You don't know anything anymore. It's impossible that you could possibly do a job anymore because how could you? You gave birth. You just lost all your brain cells. And us mothers joke about mommy brain, especially when you're pregnant, doesn't really exist but the fact of the matter is is you have to give people the benefit of the doubt that if they had spent a certain amount of time in their professions in their career and stopped for a time to raise their family yes some things are going to be rusty but fundamentally they know their crap you just have to give them a pathway back in um and not only do you have to give them a pathway back in but you have to give them a way to sustain themselves so anybody that's thinking of this, implementing this, or has done it and is treating it like an internship where this is just, you know, free, you're doing a greater good kind of thing, and um, there's no expectation of pay, that's absurd. It's absurd. They have to get paid. And in fact, they're doing this because it's a means to an end. This training that you're offering, it's a means to an end. What they really need is a job and a full-time job. And they need it like yesterday probably unless they've got tons and tons and crap loads of money because they've got bills to pay, mortgages to pay, child care costs that are $18,000 a year and upwards of that that take about 30% of anything you're willing to give them. So for me, JP Morgan made sense. VP level pay, you know what? If even it's not exactly what they were paid prior to going on maternity leave, it's a hell of a lot more than zero. It's something they can sustain themselves on. And then the mentorship, and then the idea that they actually get a position, I'm here for it. I'm absolutely here for it. Um, one of the other successful fellowships is one called on ramp see the buzzwords i can't but it's called on ramp fellowship and um they have managed to get four big law firms under their belt it's for people who are in the legal field and so it's a fellowship that allows you to come in and you get excuse me an associate position and i think an associate position usually pays like 160,000 they give you $125,000 stipend and again the mentorship and the training um you know and in return I mean let's talk about how the the employer is actually benefiting they actually get competent people to work on their cases it's like a win-win so somebody gets their career back it's a pathway to getting their career back and they get competent people 
um, helping them to execute whatever it is that they need to execute. So it just makes sense. Um, some other companies that have it is Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse. I'm not as familiar with the particulars of their uh, returnship programs, but these are just like really isolated instances that I'm talking about in terms of companies that are actually preparing themselves to receive mothers back. By and large, what actually happens? You know, people, women go, they go have kids and they return to work and their life has changed. It's life changing. I mean, even if you didn't anticipate it before the child gets here, it's life changing. Um, you've got a whole nother being to think about. And so, you know, late nights at the job, because just because like many offices like for you to do is to just be there to be seen as though you're doing something um that kind of goes out the window right that's one two if you were fortunate enough to find a private babysitter or even a nanny those people have to go home at some particular time so you know you can't really pull those all-nighters like you used to i mean you can but with some flexibility um your child gets sick who's gonna if you don't have family nearby or somebody to just kind of hop in what do you do it's on you as the woman to have to go get your child you know do you have an employer that's kind of kind about those things it's been my experience that not many of them are very nice about these things um their primary concern is get the work done. And so the more that all these little things start to crop up, child sicknesses, daycare issues, um, you know, increased needs for flexibility, whatever it is, um, is when they start to then ding the woman for having those obligations. And so, you know, promotions come up. Whereas if you didn't have children and you were able to do everything they wanted you to do, you'd be promoted right up the ranks. Now that you've got all these things going on, you know, some of these people start to second guess. Not because it makes sense, but they just start to second guess like, hmm, should we keep her? Uh, should we promote her? No, maybe we should leave her where she is because we really need somebody that can stay late and we really need people that can be hands-on and I don't understand how she can be hands-on with kids. These are just some of the little conversations and rumblings I've heard over the years sitting in HR. And so my feeling is that many companies are not prepared to receive mothers back into the workforce after they've had children and let's not forget it's not even just people that have had childbirth we're talking about women who have decided to adopt and take time off to bond with that child it also impacts women and even men on some level when you have aging parents and say you know you have to take off time to see that a parent is getting to their treatments or doctor's appointments or they're hospitalized for a long period of time and you have to attend to those things. Those things are other instances in which workforces don't seem prepared to deal with these things. Um, but, you know, tonight, my whole thing is that th there is a value and making sure there's a pathway for women to re-enter after they've been out. Personally, I have had the opportunity to work with stay-at-home moms who have done this exact thing of having a profession, leaving it to take care of their families. I've had that opportunity for about a year and a half now to work with um, that population. And I can tell you that there comes a time when they do want to return to work, many of them, not all of them, but many of them. And it becomes very um, debilitating and disconcerting for them when they 
meet with a brick wall when nobody wants to have a conversation with them nobody will even hear them out about what they can bring to the table they're just getting rejection after rejection after rejection it really takes a toll on their self-worth um and how they perceive themselves and you know it leads to other issues once they can't re-enter the workforce not only financial personally emotionally it's an issue so for me i really wish that more employers would raise their hand and say you know what there's a pool that we're not tapping into um, with people that have left the workforce on hiatuses we're not really giving them a fair shake i think that you know we need to kind of figure out programs or ways or pathways in order to welcome these people back um and you know what maybe it just starts with when these people go on leaves in the first place rather than get excited anxious or angry about the fact that they're having a leave at all figure out a way for it to work like literally sit down have a discussion with the person open and figure out a way that it can work we have technology it doesn't always require that you need to be firmly planted in a seat to be valuable when i had my second child i literally was on maternity leave my last two weeks doing a project remotely from home while taking care of my infant and my then three-year-old and then phase back into the workforce thereafter. It can be done. <laughs> it can be done. I'm proof that it can be done. And I really just wish that more employers took this seriously, one, and two, just got a little creative and had some more open conversations and had a willingness to understand that one, they're missing out, um, and two, that they can be retaining a huge section of the workforce. I mean, women are leaving. They are literally leaving the workforce because they're between a rock and a hard place. And I've discussed this before, back when I talked about entrepreneurship and the fact that women are the largest growing segment and why that is. The reason why women are the largest segment of entrepreneurs, literally, is because of the lack of opportunity. Pushing them in a corner. When you push people in a the corner, they have to make a decision. So if there's gonna be a decision between whether they can have a career and have a family, and then you're coupled with childcare and issues and, and bosses being on their back once they've had the children because they have to take care of their obligations, you know what? Some people just say, I'm done. I rather sit here and build a business for myself and do what I have to do to get by financially than to have to deal with that. And at least my kids are taken care of. I know who's taking care of them. Three, I'm saving money on daycare. And four, I don't have to deal with anybody's shit because I have obligations to my family. Period. End. I know for me, that was one of the key reasons why I left corporate America was for the flexibility. I came back from maternity leave, literally came back from maternity leave, and my boss wanted to change my telework days like for like the third, fourth time that she had just because. It was like no bona fide reason why she was changing it. She just wanted to change it again. She made a bogus reasons just to screw with me. And her decision to screw with me was costing me was costing me in daycare daycare their on-site daycare which was very generous at one point was going up as much as like 30 and 40 percent which with a 3.5 percent raise every year really doesn't much help me pay a child care bill that's like a mortgage right so to me it was like were they welcoming me back into the workforce no i was very much unwelcomed and when you get beat down enough like that, you just snap. So what did I do? I went home. I After that conversation, after she came to me for the umpteenth time about my telework days, 
I literally came home and spoke to my husband and I said, I cannot do this anymore. I already knew I was going to go into my business full time, but that was going to be like the next year. But like, I just couldn't do it anymore. And he was like, you know what? You do what you have to do. And it wasn't easy at first, but I did it. I left. They lost a high performing woman employee um, because they had an unwillingness to meet me halfway. Period. End. It wasn't like I was a poor performer or anything like that. I left in great graces, but they lost a good employee all because one, they were unwelcoming when I came back, two, they screwed with me about things that were obligations. This is my family we're talking about, my personal life. I never, it never impeded anything I had to do for them, but it was an issue. And so I'm not alone in that. Like, this is just me telling one story. You can get a gazillion other people giving you the same story who are parents. It's an epidemic. It's an issue. Um, and so that's why I think tonight I wanted to not only just like bring the issue to light, but also to share the companies that are trying to do something about it. Because I think there's something to be said for companies that are trying. Um, but unfortunately, collectively, we're not trying hard enough because women are still in that rock and hard place trying to figure out what do I pick? Career, family, career, family. What do I do? Um, and, you know, it almost always comes down to family. For some people, it ends up being career, but something suffers when you have to be put in that box to make that decision, um, which is foul. It's It sucks. It's not nice. And I'm really trying to do the best that I can to change that trajectory. So quick plug, if you follow me on social media, at Serena of HR, all over the place, next week, particularly on my blog, I'll share more about this personal branding and social media academy that I am pretty much heading up and also teaching in, in conjunction with Work Like a Mother. Work Like a Mother is a career transitional organization um, specifically created for women, for mothers who have lost their way, lost their mojo, who want to re-enter the workforce and don't know how. So my good friend and colleague, uh, Hillary Berger, is the head of Work Like a Mother, and this is the work that she's doing every day from a therapeutic standpoint and also from a career planning standpoint. Um, so I met her some years ago, and I'm so pleased to know her today and to still be friends with her and still be working with her. And we launched this academy last year after talking about it for two years, and it was wildly successful. So this is the second year that we are doing this academy and we are so happy to also have Indeed um, as one of the partners doing this job search end of it. So I'm doing the social media and personal branding piece. Indeed does the job search and it's a beautiful marriage. So we will be kicking off um, in April and going through June and registration is open, so all of that will be up on my blog next Monday. Um, I'll also be sending it out through my newsletter, so if you're not subscribed to the Aristocracy of HR yet, you really need to do that. Like, hop there now, the thearistocracyofhr.com. Um, but this is the work that I'm passionate about. Like, I'm passionate about a lot of things, but I'm a mom, first and foremost, and I don't feel like any woman should ever feel like they're in a box and they can't do for themselves financially and professionally. Everybody has that right at whatever level they choose to be. And so this academy for me is like a full circle moment where I get to take what I know from an HR perspective and what I've learned, what I've chosen for myself, chosen to teach myself. Um, and give it back to women who need it to get ahead, right? Because that's what this is about. And 
this is why I'm kind of tackling this. It's Women's History Month. And yes, we can spend a whole lot of time looking at how we've gotten to this place. We can spend a whole lot of time talking about women in the past and what they did and all of that is great. But I think it's much more important to remain in the present and also understand that there are things that have to be done now and that, you know, it takes nothing for you to reach back and grab another woman's hand and bring them up with you. Like that's my whole thing. Like I'm not a hater. I'm all about trying to help other women be great. And more specifically in this case, helping other moms be great. So this is my pet project. I love it. Please join me next week as I talk more about it. And if you know people that can use it, it's going to be held at Symphony Workplaces in Westport, Connecticut. So if you know anybody in those parts that would be interested or in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, we would love to have them. Um, and that's what I've got. Um, also on the Aristocracy of HR, just so you know, I hit you guys with two blogs this week. So one is actually recapping a podcast that I did on predictive analytics and talent management and why that's a perfect union. So you can check that out. What the hell? Please, Mimi K. What? And but wait, hold up. Let me before I go further with the, the blog thing, let me just stop here. You're late for everything. See now, please Mimi K, that's my boo. I've known this chick from like sandbox days, like kindergarten, literally. But when I tell you that she's that friend, you know, that is fashionably late for everything, fashionably late, cause she don't know that I'm about to sign off like right now. But I love you though, I do. I love you for jumping on. <laughs> so as I was saying, a Perfect Union, that was the first blog I kicked off this week, Monday, and that was um, Predictive Analytics and Talent Management, so check that out. That's recapping my podcast with Human Capital Institute. And the second one I discussed was three tips for having real-time diversity conversations. Huge, huge, huge. I'm going to talk about this a lot this year because it's needed. I don't have to tell you why it's necessary, although somebody did find themselves asking me this on Twitter, bless their heart. But like, if you don't know why real time diversity conversations are needed, like right this moment, I don't even really know what to tell you. Like, just turn on the news, turn on CNN. For God's sakes, look at what's trending on Twitter. There's a need. In any event, those are the two blogs that are up on the aristocracy of HR. So please please check it out. And like I said, please subscribe. You subscribe, you find out when these things go live. So I hope that this topic was helpful. Um, if you're a mom and you're looking to get back in and you happen to have an interest in any of these sectors, whether it's Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, by all means, check out and see what they're doing with these returnships. And for employers, if you happen to be watching me, get your crap together or hire me, hire me to come and help you figure out how you can create a pathway for mothers. That's a thought. That is a thought. So I'm out of here. Hey, Brian Moran, <laughs> you jump on when I'm jumping off, but I love you guys for joining me. So catch us on the replay. Hello to my replay viewers and have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Thanks so much, Kimberly. I appreciate it. Take care, guys. Bye.